where uh, there's so many people who are still in the town they grew up in. I have a graduated class of uh, 101 from the class of 98, and I bet you there's probably 25 of us or 20 of us still in the area. So it's um, certainly nice. It would be nice to hear stories about the town that I grew up in, so many of you did as well. We'll start the evening with the Pledge of the Flag, and then we'll, we'll get going.
was hard work. But that was a thrill for a little kid to go on these big, huge trucks. I think they were, one of them was an international, and they were green. The cabs were green, and uh, a diamond T something, I don't know. But, uh, they had two-speed axles and all that stuff, you know. And, uh, there was different routes here in the, in, the, in the town. And I mean, there was cows right here in the village. Uh, Currents had cows, and the Dukesbury Apartments, there was farm there, they had cows. Used to pull in there and get the get the cans and, uh, and here's a little kid you know he's four or five years old eyes wide open you know and oh my god you know and these old farmers had come out you know and they'd poke it or something and they had the bib overalls on the manure on and you know <laughs> right out of the barn you know and, uh, that, that was quite a thrill for me when I was a kid and, and, the, and the most cans that my dad ever picked up was over at the Carvet farm on. Uh, Maple Roads, uh, I think it's the first uh, cobblestone house there. 29 cans at one stop. That was a lot of cans of uh, milk. And they were all, they had the lettering on the cans. And the cans, uh, you put them in so you took them to the dairy. They went to the falls. There was a lot of dairies out there where they processed the stuff after it was loaded. And then you had to bring them back and unload them to the right farmers. A lot of times you had to bring the, he brought the checks back too for the milk. Farmers, and I can remember some of the farmers complaining that they got cheated and everything else. You know, <laughs> some of them send a half a can or something like that. You know, but I can remember all this stuff when I was, when I was a little kid. And uh, what what a great time to grow up in Wilson. I mean, uh, they had all the Wilson was a busy place back then. I mean, it, it wasn't like Main Street is now. It's all the parking lots. Where all the parking lots are, there was buildings. You know. Theater. I saw my first movie at the theater, Ben Hur. I think it was 1961 or something like that, you know. And uh, that was a great place. And uh, there was always entertainment uh, around the village, you know, uh, growing up. Uh, you go skating down to the creek and the harbor, and uh, you had the hill next to the cemetery that's all grown up down here. That was great sledding down, you know, the hill. And, uh, of course, we had our bikes. That was remote, you could go anywhere, you know. Go down in the springtime, you'd go down to the harbor and uh, talk with Merle Wilson and Floyd and Walt, you know, they're always telling stories, especially Merle. And uh, the commercial fishing was going on. I can remember bringing in the Merle's boat and Nancy Jane, uh, when they'd, they'd take the set the nets and they'd come in with perch or whatever else that they were catching out there. There was quite a few uh, commercial fishermen down there. And, and Walt had the dock center. And uh, for a quarter, you could ride over to the uh, to the island and back. Yeah, that was cool. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, this stuff's all gone. Kids don't know what it was like, you know. And, uh, uh, springtime, you go fishing or spearing uh, out at the creek. And, uh, things seem to go in seasons, you know, like uh, the horse chestnuts that come around and you gather them up and throw them, and, uh, <laughs> and pea shooters. It was the season for them too. It was like a plastic tube, and you buy the peas at Debbie's uh, Red and White or other places, and they, and they had peas all over town. <laughs> Beans or whatever they were, you know. And, uh, there was just so much going on. Well, and when I went to kindergarten, when I went to kindergarten in the high school, Thomas Marks wasn't there. Well, it's got the new name, uh, whatever it is now. But, uh, I think. Kindergarten through third, I went to uh, a high school. And then they sent us over to Thomas Marks, and you come back for seventh grade in uh, the high school. And uh, well, fast forward a little bit, and uh, I was I was almost 12 years old, and I got a newspaper. My neighbor in my backyard, that was Bob Van Hoosen. He was graduating from high school in 1961, and he had the paper. He was giving it up. I wasn't quite old enough yet to be 12 years old, but I got it. I, I lacked about a month. I got it. And, uh, and I started delivering newspapers. And there, there were so many uh, of the older people that I got to know. And they were all, uh, all great people. And uh, that's kind of how I know so many different people, especially the older ones. And most of the ones, uh, a lot of them are gone. 
just so many, and there was a lot of uh, old widows at that time, and they always wanted somebody to do something for them, you know, like trim the heads, or wash the whole thing, you know, you know. I had more jobs, and, and I could, a lot of times I could even do it, because I had to go to school, too, you know. <laughs> Cutting grass, I mean, jobs, changing uh, storm windows, these, these were the big old heavy things you had to bring down and put the screens on. No, I, I think the, the, the older ladies had a circuit or something because pretty soon I was getting calls from so and so I didn't know what they were doing. Would you come over and wash my windows and turn my head cut my grass and stuff like that? And I, I look at Marge Williams here. I used to work for her mother, Alice Carter, yeah. on Wilcox Street, cutting her grass. Yeah. Very nice lady. She always treated me good. And I worked for her right up until I started working in the factory. And, uh, and Alice Nelson on the corner of uh, Catherine and Hunter Street. And Ruth Meyer, she worked in the Pulse Nelson in the corner. And Harold and Esther Althright, Cindy's here. I got these little good jobs for them. And, uh, and I can remember all the people who worked in the post office. Harold Albright was the postmaster. Ruth Myers, Milford Mudge. Mother. And that was what was on Main Street there. Well, anyway, I'm going to get to my, my newspaper days. And I brought some of my paraphernalia here from when I was a, a young guy. I still got it. And uh, we used to pick our papers up right in front of the old post office. I know this is this month's uh, issue of the uh, historical. Uh, Magazine, whatever you call it, the newsletter. And uh, the old post office was right next to the hub. This is on the whole hotel here. It was right next to the hub. That's where they dropped them off. There was four paper routes in Niagara Gazette. I had one of the bigger ones, 65 papers every day, and on Sunday sometimes it was more or less. And uh, it was four paper routes. And the kids at my, when I was delivering, it was the Upton boys. It seemed like when one up in three uh ran away and was another one to take over. <laughs> Same with the weight boys. <laughs> there was always the weight boys going you know. The Burn Scrabble had one of the small roots. And uh, and I had one. But I got the longevity on all of them, because I kept mine for seven years. And I kept it from sixty one until I graduated in nineteen sixty eight. Wow. And uh, seven days a week, yeah, daily on Monday through Saturday was the dailies, and then Sunday, you had to get up early and do the Sunday paper. Wednesdays, the paper was like 70 pages a day. You had to put inserts in, and uh, we used to have the, a lot of times I'd take two paper bags and have them crisscrossed, you know, they were heavy. And uh, this is the wrapping, I even got some of them left. It was wrapped around their papers with bale and twine. It's got my name on it, and it's, uh, it's RTZ 45 is my number. And they throw them out in front of the post office there, usually about 3.30 in the afternoon. The Sunday papers they bring to your house. And uh, so they start delivering and uh, we used to use rubber bands, but rubber bands cost money. And I tried folding today's union sun, because it isn't a gazette and the the Union Sun has shrunk, so you know the paper was about that much lighter. You, know, you could get a fold in it. You used to be able to fold it when you were writing your bike like this. I got the buffalo paper here. That's folded pretty good. And you just toss it up on the porch as you went, went down the street. And some people had little cubby holes where you stuck them in. Them, and uh, there used to be a little milk box. When the milk man would put the milk in, you'd stick it in there. And, and, and the old ladies on Fridays and Saturdays, they had to collect. You know, it was 60 cents a week, 45 for the daily and 15 cents for the Sunday. You know? They'd leave the money out in a certain spot and they'd get it. You know? Very nice people, these people. I, I miss them all. But uh, this is probably one of the first ones. I got a picture of me in 1962 with my cousin with a paper bag. And uh, I was 13 years old then. And my favorite bike was a J.C. Higgins with balloon tires. They seemed to hold up the best. <laughs> and uh, we were always making pit stops because you'd, you'd have a flat tire. Like today, kid has a flat tire or the, or the chain brake.
breaks or falls off, you see it out to the road. And it was gone. <laughs> we had to fix our stuff. You go up to Horton's Hardware or Russ Sheffler's Hardware and uh, get a master link for the chain or a tube for the tire or a new tire or whatever, you know, and uh, we do it ourselves. We had these little kits to pick, put patches on the tubes and uh, get it all yourself. Replacing bearings too. We, we rolled the bike so much we used to wear the bearings out on them. You had to take them apart, put bearings, repack the grease and everything. And, uh, well, anyway, this one here hasn't got as much use as the other one there because it wasn't too long after I started they come out with it, they put the orange on these so that you wouldn't get hit. You can see it. <laughs> and uh, this one's had a lot of use. And uh, I just wanted to. So the holes here, and the, the holes were from dogs. Because back then there was no leash law or whatever. It was the dogs ran loose and paper boys were fair game. <laughs> and that's what these are. And as I got older, I used my bike and my bag to protect me from getting bit. But some of them got through and they got in the rump, in the calf, and in the ankle. I got bit in the fingers one time. Uh, that was part of the hazards of the job, I guess. <laughs> and this was my collection book. This one's from 66, 67. The first one on there is Max Barbershop. I don't know if anybody remembers Max Barbershop. Uh, what a great guy he was. And uh, I got a lot of the older people in here. I mean, they're just about all gone. Your punch, you punched out what we could pay for. Yeah, the daily was 50 cents for Saturday or from Monday through Saturday, and the Sunday paper was 15 cents. That's how cheap it was back then. And, uh, I don't know if any of you remember, maybe some of you do. Harvey Lonsberry. He uh, he was my manager, and uh, he drove a Studebaker. A lot of people grow Studebakers because. Bud and Roger Ward, who just passed away, they, they, they sold Studebakers down here on Lake Street. Uh, Champ has his shop there now. And uh, the guy that used to deliver our papers to the, uh, to the post office was Wilbur Reese. He lived up on Chestnut Road. He drove a Studebaker truck. So there was a lot of Studebakers. And when we broke our bikes, the pedals got busted off. We used to go over to Elvin Flagler's welding shop next to the doctor's office over there on High Street. Heat the thing up, put the new one, we had the new one put it in, or the handlebars would be broke, they'd weld it for us, 50 cents a buck, you know, and we'd be on our way. And he drove us through the bacon. <laughs> 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 uh, so, I mean, that, that was, uh, and then when I graduated from high school, uh, I mean, you were a businessman, you had to, you had to collect money and uh, Manager be Harvey Lasbury and come and, uh, and, uh, and collect you know, 50, 60 bucks you had to pay for the paper. What was left, you got, you know. And, uh, uh, and you had to manage money and do things. That was a lot for a young kid. And it, the older I got, the smarter I got. Because <laughs> uh, there were some people who would take advantage of you. And, uh, the older you got, the smarter you got. So. <laughs> Well, anyway, when I come around for the last time to collect it, a lot of the old ladies were in tears because I was, you know, I was graduating from high school and uh, it was time to give it up. And, uh, I gave it to uh, Mike Denny. He only had it, I don't know, not quite a year. And then my brother got it, Rodney. He had it for four or five years. And that was, uh, it was a real time because there was so much stuff going on in Wilson at that time. Remember the, that was the hot rod air, like I was saying. There was a lot of entertainment. There was cars burning around, around Main Street. Any time of day or night. <laughs> and uh, all them bars, Pepper Martins, where Jeans is now. I mean, it was just, it was, it was, a, it was a wild time, wasn't it, Chuck? <laughs> it, was, it was entertainment. And, uh, I mean, you could set up in the four corners and just, it was, it was something. That stuff's all gone now. And, uh, we used to buy our pop at the grocery stores, Timpy's IGA, cold Pepsi, 10 cents. You got two cents and you brought the bottle back. And, uh, <laughs> our 
candy bar was a nickel, a fun sickle was a nickel, a nutty buddy was a dime. Just so many things. And my dad was helping me deliver papers on, on Sunday morning. It was in the 60s sometime, and there was a fire. It was uh, Zabel's uh, Vinegar Works over here, right where the parking lot is of the, uh, the brewery. Mm -hmm. And it, it burned. And it, you could smell vinegar all over the village of Wilson. <laughs> it was a sunny morning, and we went up and we were watching. You, know, you could hear the, I don't know what they were, the, must have been the cans or bottles of vinegar blowing up inside. And, uh, it was a big thing that happened. I think I'll let Chuck talk for a while. But, <laughs> uh, that was that was some of the things. Then when I graduated, I went I went to Harrison's to work, and I had to go. I went in the service for four years, and, and uh, in the U.S. Coast Guard, and uh, I come out. I stayed in the Select Reserve, and I retired from the Select Reserve. And uh, it's quite a time in Wilson. Uh, it was just. The main street, there was just so, when we were waiting there for our papers every afternoon, there was just so much activity. You know, they had all the businesses and they're all gone now. And, uh, so many people, and, they, and all the places had apartments. I used to go up and down the stairs delivering for the people that lived up in the apartments, and, uh, above the old Shefflers and uh, uh, the Hulk. And uh, we used to stand there waiting for the guy to bring the papers. And And, and yet I could uh, 
this, this John Kern, you could ask him the same story, he might say he might not remember. You know, one person remembers and the other person just gone. And then uh, as we got a little older, of course we had allowance. You had an allowance you got, your parents keep the allowance, so I had to earn the allowance and I had chores to do. Well, my father had this hardware store that they just recently uh, tore down with, with Jill Murray had her farm and garden. There was originally two big buildings there, and that was uh, that was the hardware. And I used to have to go down there and help out and do different things. Freight day, the, the freight would come in, we'd unpack freight, and later on, he showed me how to cut and stretch pipe. There was no plastic pipe in those days. It was all iron pipe, or just a little bit of copper. It was just starting to come in. But the farmers would come in, they 42 inch beef, 11 inches, this and that. They were doing some plumbing in their barns or whatever. He's there cranking on the old pipe threader. It didn't matter whether it was winter or summer, you know, you're out there doing that. But one of the things I remember with the freight was the nails came in these barrels. They were called nail cakes, about this high. They were rounded a little bit. And they weighed 100 pounds a piece. And we had this hand cart. My father showed me how you set them up and get them on the cart and wheel them into the room. Get them in front of the bin. You take a hammer and whack the top out of the cake, pull the wood away. Then you start taking the scoop and raking the nails out of it and throwing them in so you, eventually so you could get it light enough where you could, you know, pick it up and, and throw it in there. And that, that lasted maybe until, I'm guessing maybe the mid to late 50s, maybe 57, 58, uh, they stopped putting the, the nails and kegs and putting them in cardboard boxes. And then they went from 100 to everything it was 50 pounds, which is a little more manageable. But the uh, great memories of the store, the early days, we just had this big, of course, when you're this high, everything was bigger. We had this pot belly stove cover stood this high, big old iron thing. And uh, come fall, we had, it, we had it on these rollers, casters like in the back room. You'd pull it all away from the wall and put the stove blacking on and polish it all up, and wheel it out to the, by the chimney there, and put, put the new pipe in, and then when the winter set in, we, the old timers, they walk up town to get the mail, they'd stop, get warm by the stove, tell a few stories, there was always just cheers around the stove. And, uh, you know, there was, that, that would create entertainment. They'd be telling Kibitzen, you know, and telling all this stuff. But uh, and then we also had, uh, my father was a fireman. So, uh, not right away, but eventually, there was a, a, a fire pole in the store. And then, back then, had a fire, you called, the number was 2111. And there was, I think, either five or six phones that rang simultaneously. Usually the fire chief had one. I think uh, Kenny Walker's store might have had one. There was one in the firehouse itself, there was one in our store, I forget where the other ones were. And you pick the phone up, and the, the two plungers would lift up, and you could hear. And if nobody was talking, there was a plunger, you pull that plunger up and then you would talk and say, fireball. And they'd say, oh, I have a fire over on the maple road, da, da, da. And they never gave any numbers. There was no name. <laughs> <laughs> so no numbers back then. They never gave a name, you know. So then with that plunger up in the air, there was a little wall switch, a little thumb thing, and you could you push that up. And the siren would start to crank up. And then you, you had to... And then when it reached the high pit you let off on it, it would die down. And then you'd hit it again and you'd walk and go down. So then as the fireman started to come, you'd run out the door and tell them, it's up to so and so on the fire rope, you know, the way to go. But that was, that was a memory we had. And, uh, and uh, I could say there was, uh, and then uh, back up a little bit, I don't know, I was maybe guessing, I don't know, eight or nine, maybe ten. Or in the store one day, and here's this brand new bicycle. 24 inch roll fast bicycle. Mm -hmm. and says, there you go, there's your bike. So wow, you know, man. And Gary talked about it. That was the freedom of, of the, the bicycle. Everybody had bicycles. Girls, boys, ride down to the harbor, ride all over, ride to the school, ride all over. There was a bicycle rack at the school. You used to you ride your bike to school if you wanted to. And then, uh, the location of Wilson is uh, kind of unique. 
It's a small little village on Main Street. That's one facet. Then up here at the depot, it was like the industry with the uh, vinegar works and the canning factories and stuff. And that type of industry was up here. And then you had the harbor. And you got these, not only did you have a harbor, but you had this huge bay and you had two major creeks, the east and west range of the, of the 12 mile feet into it. It was the best playground in the world. <laughs> we would go down there, there was paths all along these creek banks where the fishermen used to walk and the kids would play. And I went, went down there about four or five years ago and you could just faintly see where some of these paths were. Because, you know, you know it's changing times. So we couldn't wait to get out of the house. I remember my father pounding and he said, Now oh, let, your, let your meal digest. <laughs> <laughs> baseball game. This is going on. And like Gary says, when you're younger, if you want to go down to the village, because then the older guys, they're racing around with the car, and the radios are playing, and the you know the action, like he says. The, the, and then later on, they refer to this cruising. So you went cruising, you got a car. And I remember doing it when I got my my first car. You know, you went to lot for around the block, around the block. Kids on the corner, turtles howling, ravens blowing horn, radios playing, tops up, tops down, you know, all this sort of thing, you know. And that was, that was, you know, the great, the great entertainment. But uh, we used to play behind the school, too, with, uh, I remember playing the, uh, we, we played the, uh, we didn't have any dads or how we had a football. Mm -hmm. Well, there you played football. Tag, of course. Play that they couldn't see. I remember running smack into somebody, you know, and you're all right, you're all right, you want know, to get up and stay at home, you know. And my mother always was screaming about my jeans, well, always grass me, you know. Of course you can't get that out, you know. And, uh, but it, it was, it was uh, some great times. And, I, and like Gary mentioned, then later, later on, I, uh, I ended up uh, working at the Paris Radiator. And, uh, and then like this. Kind of, once you could get a full time job, uh, there's a great book written by this gentleman in, in Barker. It's, it's, it's called, I believe it's called Being a Boy Was Fun in the Uvana. He's describing all these similar things that I'm describing. And he says, basically, when you took a job or you got married, well, then you stopped being a boy. The responsibilities. But uh, going back to the Studebakers, when I uh, Kenny Walker, he drove a scooter maker. And uh, he used to deliver groceries too. Yep, he used to, he had a station wagon, a red station wagon, and he'd have it back up in front of the store. And he'd flip the window up and tailgate you down, he'd put the groceries in, and you could call the uh, red and white Willard Evans or, or, or Kenny Walker and follow up and put your order in. And they would bring it to you with no charge. Well, I'll have it there this afternoon, or whatever, around two or something like that. And they bring it out with no matter what the weather. And then uh, uh, Willard Evans ran the red and white store. His father had a little barber shop right? in the back, a little, uh, little tiny boxy building here in the barber shop. Well, uh, I was about maybe 18, 19 at the time. I was up with Don Kerwin pumped gas at his gas station. Willard's father, Ray, pulls up in this torpedo shaped Studebaker. <laughs> they had that gun. He pulls up in front of the high test pump. So I figured, well, he's an old guy, he don't know what he's doing. He wants. Ray, says, you're, you're at the wrong pump. He looked at me and says, no, he says, this stuff is bad pump. He says, <laughs> <laughs>
And then gas stations, you know, they, uh, you know, they had uh, the little village had uh, Kirkland's, they had uh, Ralph Truesdale's, they had Don Lord's, they had uh, the Nelson, Mr. Nelson's place, they had, uh, uh, and then later they had the Hermannie's Pizza, one of that was a vessel station. Mm -hmm. so, and the Ward, the Ward Brothers, they sold gas. Mm -hmm. So just a little village alone, you know, and you say, well, now, now we got one place, we got gas. But and then he used to pump it. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you <laughs> touch the pump. You go over the rubber hose and she go, da ding, da ding, and then you back the rubber, <laughs> do your windshield and all that stuff. <laughs> yeah, they, 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 they want to do your windshield. And yes, you go in and check your oil. And, but uh, yeah, it's it's it's, it's, uh, it's, 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 been, it's changed a lot. You know, it goes around too. So I found things similar to people. You know, you, 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 you can't pay the person back to you have to pass it on to somebody else. Who's moving on. And we used to play, like I say, the kids would play up near the railroad track and these creeks, oh my God. And then later on, some of the guys had motor boats. And I remember the, one guy used to have a motor, so we'd take the motor and we'd run a with one of the Wilson brothers. And, they, and those guys, those Wilson brothers and, 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 their, and their cousin Merle, we were must have been like family to them. They were always telling us stories and, and you know, they were so friendly. It was unbelievable. But later on, I, I was uh, a, a cute story about the island. And, and, well, they used to have dances on the island. Mm -hmm. I don't know where Gary grew up, but they used to have dances on the island. So we used to Barrel or a boat roll or go to dance on Friday or Saturday night during the summer. You know, I'd roll back. <coughs> Sometimes your boat would get stolen, you'd have to hit your ride or something. <laughs> <laughs> but later on, uh, uh, Fred Clark acquired the, the boathouse and he gave me this, this book. It was like a, a ledger, I guess, from, from the Wilson brothers. And I had to sit this up in over in the library of the museum. And it was you know, all the cottages on the island listed by number. And uh, so I was going through it was, and they would say like, so but again, they would call up and say, when you come over, bring me this, bring me that, see. And it'd be like a candy bar or whatever. You know? <laughs> and there was this one item that was 50 cents. And it's just the, how their handwriting was. That's all this 50 cent stuff on here. And it was like a line, and it looked like a C and a B. If I made a dog, I'd be a big dummy. It was ice. <laughs> <laughs> ice boxes, you know. So, like I say, and then, uh, like Gary, Gary mentioned the, the people they delivered paper to. I remember uh, 
Bob Kramer, the plumber, he comes to the hardware store and he had a count there, Bob had a count charge, charge things. I remember he had a yellow Ford pickup truck, the one was 55 or 6 or something like that. I lived up to the beach, he'd come in, also went to the island with a boat. Yeah, they went over there. Well, they all did, yeah. So you had to go over the workplace. But uh, those are some of, the, some of the stories that we have. So I'm sure if people can add a couple of stories to them. But, uh, anybody have any questions or want to hear any more? Nonsense? <laughs> <laughs> Our driver red car in 1964 was a Studebaker. Oh, wow. <laughs> Here in town, yep. <laughs> Max Ransom had a Studebaker. Yeah. Because my grandmother bought it. It was a Studebaker president. She couldn't see over the steering wheel. <laughs> she had two cushions and she could see through the steering wheel. And she couldn't. She never used a mirror to back up. She just put it in reverse and back up. <laughs> and you could hear her come down the road. Probably by Maple Road, you could hear her coming because there was no muffler on it. <laughs> so she always thought that was the greatest car. It makes a student maker present. There was another woman in town. She didn't drive a student maker. But they talked about driving. She, uh, she ran the business for uh, Kyle's mother. It's a flower shop there. And it was called Walker's Apparel. Her name was Mrs. Walker. Mrs. Walker. 34 o'clock, she had had her home. She won't be here to speak. I think it was about 60 or 61 old mobile. And she had she had our prize, you know, she did it there. She was very fired up, part thing, or something. She was what we call, well, she backed up my feet. Sure. 
lakes through the Ranceville dealership. I actually bought Green, like 
like that. And then, of course, they cook them, they'd soften them up, you know. And I remember the old tractors, they, of course, they didn't want to spend no money on nothing. And the tubes were actually coming right through the tire. And pretty soon you hear a big bang. <laughs> and they bring peas to the other cannery up here behind where Steve or uh, Clark there, what's his name now? David. John. John. John Clark's got that place now in Wilson Canyon. They take peas. Trucks to the sides on the pea vines to be hanging, just dragging on the road. And we drag the plates along. You know, <laughs> Every other place out in the country was a, was a mile and pop farm. And they usually had some cows and you know, a little orchard or something, you know. And, uh, and it was nothing to see a, 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 a tractor and a trailer, you know, an open trailer, like a hay trailer, going down Main Street in Wilson with hampers of tomatoes. Piled up, going up to the to the canning factory. Yeah, over, and over here, too. yeah, over there too. Yeah. They stack them up like a pyramid. Yeah. yeah, they did peas over there. They did uh, sour cherries. Used to get them in a five-gallon uh, gold-colored can. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the peas, you could go right up and get them. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people worked there too. I mean, it was jobs. I can remember uh, when O'Connor's had that uh, farm over there, had seven silos or something over there. Uh, mm -hmm. right. 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 Yeah, they, 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 they used to see out. the big trucks of the alfalfa going through town. They made pellets or something over Ooh. there. <laughs> like I said, every other place was a mom and pop farm. Everybody farmed. Well, you also you had, like he says, there's all these individual farmers. And now there's probably more land tilled and more crops taken off the acreage, but owned by just a handful of people. You must have called them farm factories. They're not really farms, they're like a factory. You know, they want to make a commercial business. And, you know, somebody steps out of line to give you the boot. You, know, you, don't, you don't get a second chance. You know. But yeah, they were all over there, depending on the size of the, of the farmer's family, how much crops you know, all that stuff. I think it was like the mid 60s when all the milk cans went out. They, they made them uh, put tanks in or something. Uh, they had to put tanks in. That put a lot of the little guys out of business. Yeah. yeah they couldn't afford the price. Couldn't afford the price of a tank. A whole tank. Whole the whole tank. Yeah, whole tank. But, uh, nobody. You never heard of anybody getting sick, sick to be drinking raw milk. Mm -hmm. Not a cow. Never. Well, there was a farmer and the milk and stuff. People used to go out and buy it fresh, you know, right off the cow, you know what I mean? I don't think there's a, there's a, anybody milking the cows in the, in the town. Just the factory farm. Well, yeah. But, uh, I can remember growing up when I was a kid, milk tastes different, too. Uh, yeah. Especially the milkshakes. The, where brownies it used to be Abbey's, and uh, if you get a milkshake for 30 cents, you know, I think it's $3 or something now, but... Uh, they were delicious, you know, because I guess it was because of the milk fat or something. You know, mm -hmm. It tasted all together different. Yeah. Same with the pop. Cups of coal or Coca Cola had more uh, carbonation or something. It, uh, it was a different taste. Of I can explain that. Yeah, okay, go ahead. Have you worked in a factory where we dealt with such things? Yeah. The thing is, each bodily plant put aside the ratio of corn sugar to regular sugar. Yeah. At the time, corn sugar was a lot cheaper, so they changed the reaper for it being mostly sugar to being mostly corn sugar. Now, in the book, corn sugar and regular sugar have the same bricks, the same degree of sweetness. The taste is totally different. Right. So when they put more of the corn sugar in there, it radically changed the flavor of the pot. They used to have these, uh, these Coca-Cola machines that weren't too, too big. They were around on the top, making them in front of the gas station. A bottle of Coke, I think it was six or seven ounces of mm -hmm. the little Coke bottle. The green mm -hmm. one. Yeah, five cents, see. So then they were having some problems with people bringing the bottles back. So they raised the price to six cents. Well, mm -hmm. they were never, they were going to go broke, everybody. So they didn't. <laughs> 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 but then, then the budget 
went to a dime. And like, oh, now you got to put almost a twenty dollar bill. Like, oh. But yeah. Dime Curl had one in front of his gas station. It was a dime. Upstairs, and there was the old 
Sheffler, Russ Sheffler's hardware in an apartment upstairs there. Pharmacy. Russ Sheffler's place, there was so much stuff in there, you, you, you like kind of walking around in a, a maze, you know, like whatever you wanted, he had it. He had it. And uh, Pheasant Hunt was big back then. They used to have the longest tail contest at uh, Sheffler's hardware, you know. You bring in your uh, pheasant tail, you know, and they'd measure it, you know, and then it at the end of the season, whoever had the longest one won something. You know, that was a kind of a big deal. Then they added the, uh, the restaurant portion out there before the place burned. They had a, a coffee bar in there. And, uh, it's in the old store. And there was a, uh, an alleyway between there and uh, Walker and Brown's store. And there was a place next to Oh, there was Pedal kind of Electric there. He sold General Electric uh, yeah. uh, appliances and Sherwin Williams paint. And right next to him, there was a building, building there. When I was a kid, it was called the D-Bar. It, it was a restaurant, coffee shop. I remember May Scheffler worked in there. And uh, you could go in there, deliver papers in the winter, you know. You go in there, you could get a cup of hot chocolate with whipped cream on the top and a cookie for a dime. And I thought that was just so great. <laughs> and uh, later on, uh, Jim Stevenson had his barber shop in there, in that same building. He was, he was our last barber. He was our last barber. And he, uh, next to him was Nevy's Red and White. And uh, Emerson Champion Senior, he lived up in an apartment and delivered papers above there. And then uh, Emerson Champion Jr. lived in the house where the graphics place is now. His kids are running that now, grandkids. Like he, he mentioned Mrs. Walker ran the apparel there where uh, Shelley's got her uh, flower shop. Mm -hmm. and, uh, God bless uh, Mrs. Walker. I mean, like Chuck said, she had, a, she, she had arthritis or something. I mean, she was hunched over so bad. And, uh, she would get into that big old mobile and her head would almost be in the steering wheel. You know, she, she banged into a few cars back on the other. <laughs> her and her husband ran that place. You could get anything in there, shoes, shirts. Let's well, uh, get uh, yeah. your gym shorts and your, your yeah. school sweater and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Your letters, your, your letters, the W. Sure. Yeah, the W came from school. They gave you that when you got your. Uh... But you, she sold them. She sold them. Oh, did she? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then you go down the street and, uh, where TNR is now. That was that changed hands many times. Don Moore had it, and uh, I have a letter. Gene Schrader and uh, Farron Garris. It was a Sinclair station. Then you come to the library. Then you had the Esquire Bar. The Esquire Bar is part of the library now. Then you had Doc Crimmins' jewelry shop. And that was the barber shop at the end. And now that, that was part, that's part of the library too. And I mentioned at the pool hall there, when they made the theater into the pool hall, of course we were 15, 16 year old, we'd go in there and shoot pool, you know. And, uh, and uh, these old guys like Don Tipke, he ran the IG store. and. Uh, Doc Crimmins, he ran the jewelry store there, and they'd come in, they'd have their own sticks, you know, they had the, the tube, you know, everything, you know, they, they were hot stuff, you know, they'd come in there and watch them guys roll the things around, you know, and uh, some of them old timers. Another interesting thing was, too, was back in that time frame, for lunch at school, and we were allowed to leave the school. A lot of, a lot of, not a lot, of quite a few. Students would leave the school, walk down to the village, go to the, these coffee shops, one was called a snack shack. They would go down there and, you know, and then they would go to their after school. So there was that action going on. And, yeah. and they'd stop at the other stores along the way and have a, well, that was lunchtime, there's the kids walking back and forth to school. You know. yeah. you made this, Imagine that going on today. Yeah. <laughs> Hot lunches at school were a quarter, remember that? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> thing of milk was three cents, yep. something like that. Yep. Yeah. I haven't heard you guys mention Doc Argyle. Oh, <laughs> Doc Burns. <laughs> yep, Doc Burns. Yep. 
It was over on the corner of uh, McChesney and uh, Young Street there, his house was. And I can remember going over, it, it took me there as a kid for different things. Same with Doc Arkey. Yeah, them were guys that used to come to your house when you were sick. Yeah. Yeah. They had a black bag and everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I had to let Doc Burns to get the physical to start school. Yeah. You mentioned the theater earlier. Yeah. Um, we went to a show that Randall Lou brought in there on a week night. Dr. Chucky Williams. And he really lost his butt. There was only about six of us in the audience. That particular night, there was a basketball game and the whole village was leaving when they were coming in. And it was like, but they come to the theater. Poor time. But it was just like we had him in our kitchen. We sat right in the front row and they talked back and forth all evening and played what we wanted. Yeah. We had a great time. Yeah. Like I said, there was all kinds of entertainment. You know, I mean, all kinds of stuff. There's always something going on. In those hot rod days, I mean, that was something. You, 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 a lot of these guys had souped up cars and stuff. You know, you knew who they were, you know, and everything. And, boy, that was, that was something. <laughs> well, they let them go to school. Yeah. High Street coming out of the high school there, that was like a drag strip. <laughs> 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 so it, was, it was something there, because they, they'd be burning rubber right out of the, the school parking lot. I was just going to say, there's a few things which have stayed the same. There's the, the drag strip out of the school is the same, and there's yeah. all the drunk guys above the hub. It's a firehouse <laughs> now. There's, there's different tenants, but the same, same, same tenants. <laughs> Don't lose anything, it's just something that takes its place. Exactly. That's a, you know, like a Tom Handy man, you know, where he just died here on Johnny Sachs down along the lake. And he made his living working for people over in the island. He go over there and that's all he did. And he worked during the winter, he might work a little bit for the Becky Bullface or, or the Undertaker at the time there at Jack Hayes was a, he made it, he made most of his money on that island. He just was over there, he do anything. Plumbing, painting, carpenter, all the garbage. Anything. And, uh, now it's a different, somebody else does it, you know, provides a service. But, uh, mm -hmm. you know, like you say, the old drunk slower, for slower. So. I don't think that any of the ones that need to match them guys back then. <laughs> <laughs> they, they were, they were something. <laughs> and you're a young kid, you know, you, you, you got an education from them guys. <laughs> <laughs> they all smoked cigarettes, too, no filters, you know, they didn't know. Or chewing tobacco, you know, spitting on the sidewalk. And, <laughs> They went one old guy there, they used to they used to get disgusted with them, so the bar the barkeep would say, here's a quarter, why don't you go over to so and so? So they so they kept the money go across the street. <laughs> they went flip the triangle and they said and they get tired of over there and get out of here, throw them another quarter or whatever it was for draft beer. So the door would go and make the rounds that way so he, he could work the circuit all day long. He <laughs> was a quarter of the circuit, you know. <laughs> those, those bars were, were hot in places, especially Pepper Martin's there, and uh, that's Jeans now, and uh, the Hub. And the Esquire, they're all right along in there. And, uh, well, the Hub had this porch. They had these three big pillars that were right there. You can still see the roof. Where the bars were beside the Hub. And they had this big porch up upstairs there, a screen and porch. So that'd be, that'd be, in the summertime, those the occupants who lived up there, well, they'd be lounging around out there, be <laughs> sleeping one off or whatever they were doing. So there was, there was what, and then we'd ride our bicycles underneath there, you know, we'd zip underneath there. That was a big deal, you know. Yeah, the bicycles were a big thing. You were mobile then. You could go just about anywhere you wanted to. I mean, it. And Dr. E was talking about the dogs. <laughs> oh, it was like just dogs running all over the village. Some of them were buddies, some of them weren't, you know. They, well, they hated paper boys, I know. <laughs> <laughs>
sorry. I see you're the one that got this started tonight. Okay. Her and I were sitting around here several months ago and yakking about old times. And she says, well, we ought to get a neck together and do this, so here we are. But I thought I might fill in just a few things that these younger people <laughs> <laughs> couldn't remember the wording before. Um, go back. Of course, I was on a farm, a family farm, and we never got into Wilson. But I do remember a few things about Wilson. I remember the two canning factories that I hauled cherries, peaches, down here to Hobart's. They made the best canned peaches you ever wanted to taste. And he had a, he had a, for us had a syrup that, that was out of this world. Of course, when they got towards the end of the season, those hampers would only be half full. <laughs> Alan Schultz hauled them down there to this tractor or whatever he's hauling them. Buggy in a wagon because they'd all run it down you know, the storage system. And also, to the canning factory over here, Kurt's canning factory, where I bought cherries and uh, tomatoes. And there was a big fight always in the uh, tomato season to get empty hampers. So my dad got the bright idea that we would load up the 50 Chevy truck, 275 hampers. And I would leave out about 7 o'clock at night. And at that time, Wanda was living up on the beach and we were dating. I'd pull up there with a load of tomatoes. And I'd stay there at the house until her mother kicked me out. <laughs> and then I'd come back down to Wilson to the candy factory, be first on the scales. I had my thermos of coffee, a peanut butter sandwich, and a little of blanket. And I'd take a little nap there overnight. You'd hear the trucks come in about 4, 4.30 in the morning. Lights would go on and they're ready to go on the scales. The fireman's go, what time did you get here? And I said, well, I guess before you did. <laughs> <laughs> I remember a few things about the village. I remember Speedy McClellan, I think his name was. Right. Had a little shop down there, sold everything, especially fireworks. And I'd save up a couple of dollars to go down and get fireworks for the 4th of July. But the Clark boys would always be right there in front of the the, uh, the shoe store there. Where, you know, where, well, where, uh, we got the flower shop. The mm -hmm. Smiths. Yeah, Smiths, yeah. yeah. And uh, they would have one of those big milk cans, like you were talking about, the 10 gallon milk pail. And they would get those, I guess they were M60s or whatever they were, a big firecracker. And one would get a whole can be set there, one would grab the top, they would cut this. And one of the brothers would throw one of them in, and he set out like that. And a boy went to the eater. I remember that. That's what it is. I got him a little. Pump up the air like that. He's talking about the, the uh, pressure cooker. <laughs> um, but that was that was about the problem. Uh, yeah, and I hauled many a load of apples over here to say, uh, say, uh, say, uh, uh, cider milk. But, uh, I do remember back part of the World War II. I remember listening to the radio. That's all we had then. Captain Midnight and some of the other ones. And I think it was Captain Midnight had a ring that you could buy for a quarter and a seal off from an album to over tea. Is there a mix? Chocolate mix. And you sent away for this ring. And this ring had a ring. Pardon? The colored ring. Yeah, they had the photo ring, but also we had, I got one that had the, uh, all, you put it, was a ring you put on your finger, and it had several little things you pulled up, they had all different size holes in it, and they give you pictures of airplanes. Well, you could hold that up so far, and if that airplane was in that one circle, it was so many miles away, and then put, you know, the other ring, a bigger ring, and you got it all in there, then it would be close to but I do remember the uh, P-39s coming down on the lake, and they had a big uh, target out there, floating target, and they would come down from Delaware Systems, a new plane, the test pilot, and he would try out his cannon, boom, 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 and then they'd go, brr, brr. There's quite a few planes left out there in Lake Ontario that never went back to Niagara Falls. Mm -hmm. I also do remember the air raid warden, Job, we had air raids. Mm -hmm. And you never knew 
what it was going to be, I'll wait till after dark, and all of a sudden, the Wilson Fire Company would blow their snare and do fate. Everyone, all, all that had all their snares, they all blow them at once. You had to have complete darkness in your house. They were afraid they were coming over to bounce. So Russell Sage, he was the air raid warden in our area. And he had his old Oldsmobile, and they gave him a hat, or I guess it was a helmet, and a flashlight, and a, and a billy club. And he'd get all dressed up, he'd get in that car, and then he had these uh, canvas made covers with a slid in them, and he'd put them over the headlights of his car. And that way it would just shine a little light so he could see on the road where he was going. Well, we had all the lights off in the house, and the only thing he had that was a radio. He had one of the big round top radios that had a little dial with a little light. So, uh, that's light in the candle. And my dad would make us cover that up so he could see it. I can't even see it in the house. You know? but anyway, he put down BB Road, North BB Road, down the Wilsonburg Road, down Wilsonburg Road, up Shaggy, Maple Now, down the Lake Road, and back up BB Road. And oh, he thought he was hot stuff when he was air raid board. You know, he was hot. Boy, he'd arrest you. One night, he couldn't find those blinkers he put on the headlights. So he went out of the road, turned the headlights on and off. So he said, so you see where he was going? So he turned it in. He lost his job. the school you're talking about. When I went to the first grade, my mother, I rode with my sister on the bus and put me on the bus and walked in the front door of the school, right here in the main one, that was way before Thomas Park. And my sister said to me, now you go down the hall to the very end and you go in that room. a week or two before. I was like, I think group, you know. And then from there, we went from there over to, uh, well, we also had school in the old school, which is the town hall now. And I had egg classes over there. And uh, egg, L8 was our first teacher. That's where I got the love of welding. So I do a little bit of that on the side now. But uh, other than that, it was all proof drawing mostly, proof vegetables. Don, yes, could you sir. talk a little bit about your dad and uh, when he hired the, or not hired, but when he uh, got the uh, German prisoners to come and help out on the yeah. farms? And I know it wasn't just your dad, but a lot of the farmers, right? Right. Back then we got, uh, we uh, did the German prisoners, which were up at Fort Niagara. And these prisoners weren't really all in the service. They go to town and if any man, they would take him, send him across him. That was our closest up there. But we could get 10, 10 prisoners in a car. We had to go up on our truck and pick them up. They rode the back of the truck, of course, the guard rode the truck, and we bring them to the farm. And that's, that's the help we had. And I forget, we didn't pay the government very much, and they didn't get very much. But boy, I tell you, they were workers, they were good. And you got 10 men on the farm, you never had 10 men on the farm before. We put them out there thin and peaches, which would have taken us probably three or four weeks to do with uh, two or three of us doing it, and they go through there two or three days. Now, once you showed them, they couldn't speak English, but you could show them what we were doing. And the guard, he would just sit in the truck and sleep. <laughs> and watch. And I know my dad said, well, aren't you afraid they're going to skip off? Hey, where are they going to go? They got a PW on their shirt, PW on their pants. He says, maybe one out of 50 can speak English. What are they going to do? Where are they going to go? <laughs> I know forever, but we did bust them up. We, uh, Mr. Gabby, he owned the farm that I live in now, the farm I got there now, and we split them up. And because uh, he couldn't take all ten of them, and the guard he'd spend a few hours maybe in the truck at our place and a few hours again. And uh, for lunch, I don't know what they had for breakfast or supper, but for lunch they brought dried sandwiches. No butter, no mustard, and maybe a piece of bologna in between pieces of bread, which are hard because they never wrapped them. 
and cold tea. And my mother felt sorry for me. So one day, and she didn't trust him either. So one day she told my dad when he came up at lunchtime, she said, tell them to come around to the kitchen window. So he pushed the tool for the around the kitchen window, and here she had made chicken, uh, chicken and biscuit. And, and she handed them this chicken and biscuit out the window. And you should have seen those guys working the rest of the day. And they all they wanted to come back the next day. They'd be right out there waiting for her. <laughs>